Math 1314, Tyler Junior College, section 1.5, quadratic equations, video 4 of 10. In the previous video, we introduced how to solve quadratic equations using square roots and came up with a handy four-step process. I mentioned that there was an asterisk, but never told you what it was. By the time this video is over, you will know, because one of these problems is not like the other. In fact, take a gander at them and see if you can tell me which problem you think is different than the other three structurally. I might start by asking what they all have in common. Well, obviously they all have an X, but the truth is the name of the variable is completely irrelevant. I don't know why the math teachers are stuck in a rut of always using X. I'll try to mix that up from time to time. Well, they all have squares. Good, because they're all quadratic equations. But one of these equations is not like the other. You'll find out as we go through them. Well, let's start with the first one. Solve the quantity x plus 3 squared is equal to 16. Let's use our approach. Number one, if necessary, isolate the squared term. Who has the square here? The answer is always whatever's immediately to the left of it. And the thing immediately left to the left of this 2 is a parenthesis. So the square belongs to the parenthesis and all of its contents. If I were trying to isolate the squared term, I would put a dotted circle around whoever is squared, look outside of it, and say, is there anyone out there I need to get rid of? No. So I don't have to do step one of this first example because the squared term is already isolated, so I can move to the second step, which is to square root both sides. So the square root of quantity x plus 3 squared is equal to the square root of 16. Closed captions, that's the phrase I was looking for way back in the previous series of videos. Sorry, my mind is like that sometimes. All right, so we square root both sides, and as a consequence, two things happen. Number one, we cancel the square, so that leaves an x plus three. And number two, on the other side, we use a plus minus and simplify. So plus minus, and the square root of 16 is four. But, we're not done because that doesn't say x equals. Hence, we need to do the fourth step, which is, if necessary, finish solving. Now, there's a few perspectives on how to proceed, but let me show you what you can always do next, and at the end, ask yourself, do I need to do more? What you can always do next is whatever move is necessary to get the job done, which in this case is to subtract 3 from both sides. But here's the problem with subtracting 3 from a plus-minus number. This is two different numbers, hence this is two different subtraction problems, hence it should have two different answers. For example, if I do 4 minus 3, that's just 1. But if I do negative 4 minus 3, that's negative 7. When you add or subtract to a plus minus number, it ceases to be a plus minus number because the addition problems and the subtraction problems will have different values that aren't opposite. If we were multiplying or dividing, it would be okay. So what do we do? Well, one thing you can always do is just write down your intentions. I'm trying to combine negative three and plus minus four, but it's two separate problems with two separate answers. You can always do that. In fact, let's take all these to this point and then talk about finishing them. Well, let's not because there's a surprise in store. So once you square root both sides and inject a plus minus on the right side, if you are not done solving, continue to solve. However, you might want to refrain from actually combining anything because the plus minus is two different numbers and doing things to it will produce two different answers. Remember, your preliminary goal is to get the x by itself. However, when you finish, if the terms on either side of the plus minus are like terms, and these are like terms. You'll see in a minute that they're not always like terms. Then you should combine them by splitting the plus minus. Splitting the plus minus means writing this twice. Writing, writing the problem once with the plus in between, so negative three plus four, and writing the problem again with the minus in between, negative three minus four. Then finish them. Negative three plus four is one, but negative three minus four is negative seven, and those are our two solutions. 
So you can always let the plus minus just sit there and pile things onto it. But at the end, if separating the plus and the minus give you results that you can simplify further, then you should do it. Let's try this one. Question, who has the square? Did you say 2x? If you did, look, look more closely. A square only belongs to the thing immediately to the left of it. And what is immediately to the left of the square? The x. The x and only the x has the square. If I wanted the square to belong to both the 2 and the x, it would have had to be in parentheses like that. But it wasn't. So, first rule of business, isolate the x squared. Okay, add one to both sides. We've heard this story before. That leaves 2x squared is equal to 40. You don't have to put a green dotted circle around the squared part, but you're welcome to. Help you focus on what you're isolating. And then get rid of the 2 by dividing since it's multiplied. 2 is cancel. x squared is equal to 20. First step accomplished, I've isolated the squared term. Second step, take the square root of both sides. Do you see a slight problem here? And I do emphasize slight. If we square root both sides of the equation for the purpose of canceling the square and using the plus minus on the other side, we have the square root of 20. Uh, we've dealt with that already. Well, in the previous series of videos we did. So I'll just remind you by drawing a thought cloud I'm going to invade this problem's territory just for a moment. You can think, can I split the square root of 20 into two square roots, one of which I can actually do? Yes, I can split it into the square root of 4 and the square root of 5. And I know the square root of 4 is 2, but I don't know the square root of 5, so I'm stuck with it. And I get x equals plus or minus the square root of, excuse me, plus or minus 2 times the square root of 5. Should I split the plus minus like I did over here? Well, there would be no harm in doing it. You could write x equals 2 square root of 5 and x equals negative 2 square root of 5. But is there any advantage to that? Is there anything else we can do as a consequence of that? No. Over here, there was, and so we had to. It wasn't finished. Over here, separating the plus and the minus didn't give us anything except two answers that weren't sitting on top of each other. Since no simplification occurred, it's perfectly acceptable to stop at x equals plus minus 2 squared to 5. It's also correct to do this, but in an online homework uh, situation, either one of these answers would be acceptable if it allows you to type plus minus. So that one wasn't too bad. We just had a square root. That was a little persnickety, but we got around it. Now this one, on the other hand, let's make some space. Well, let's just attack it and see what happens. Um, and by the way, I try to remember to say pause and try this, but if I don't, but you want to pause and try it, do it. You're the one watching the video. Practice it. So you might want to pause and try that one, but I'm going to go ahead and continue. Step one, who has the square? The parentheses and everything in it. There is nothing outside of the parentheses requiring isolate. Uh, to require me to isolate the squared term. So I can start with step two, which is to take the square root of both sides. So the square root of 2x minus 4 squared on the left, and the square root of negative 28 on the right. Oh, this one will be fun. The square cancels, leaving us 2x minus 4. That was the whole purpose for square rooting both sides. On the right side, we'll get a plus minus, but what's going to happen with the square root of negative 28? Well, let's think about it. And again, this is what I call a thought cloud. You can think this, but it doesn't hurt to write it out. I can split 28 into 4 times 7, and I know the square root of 4. But it was a negative 28. And do you remember who gets the negative when we make the split? The number that you can square root, in this case the 4. Because I know the square root of negative 4 is 2i, but I don't know the square root of 7. So I get 2i times the square root of 7. Which means on the right side of this equation, we now have plus or minus 2i squared of 7. But we're not done. Because step 4 needs to be done. We're not finished solving. There, there's no hope of combining like terms because of all the mess over here. It's got an i, it's got a square root of 7, and nothing else does. 
So as we start solving for x, we're just going to start piling things over here. For example, our next move is to add 4 to both sides to cancel the minus 4 on the left and leave the 2x. But we can't combine the 4 with the 2i squared of 7. They don't both have i's and they don't both have square root of 7's. There's no chance. So all I can do is write my intentions. I want to combine the 4 with the plus minus 2i squared of 7, but I just can't. Well, let's finish solving for x. Divide both sides by 2, and that gets the x by itself. But is there anything we can do with this? Well, we've already simplified the square root, so there's nothing left to do there. But what about this as a fraction? Look at all those even numbers. Who do you want to cancel? Trick question. You shouldn't want to cancel anyone. Well, you might want to, but you shouldn't actually cancel anyone because the rule for canceling a fraction is still the same as it was before, and it will be the same for the rest of time. You can only cancel parts of multiplication problems, not parts of addition or subtraction problems. Nothing in the numerator is eligible for canceling because of the plus minus, but we have a way around that. If you have a fraction with a multi-term numerator but a single-term denominator, in this case 2, you can split it into multiple fractions by giving each term on the top its own common denominator, in this case of 2. So we're going to split this fraction across the plus minus. The 4 is going to get its own denominator of 2, and the 2i squared of 7 is going to get its own denominator of 2. By making that split, it removes the plus minus from the fraction and takes away the only obstacle that was preventing us from reducing. And now I can reduce both of these. 4 divided by 2 is 2. And on the other one, the 2's cancel. Yes, you can cancel the 2's now because the 2 on top of the second fraction is now just part of the multiplication problem. The opposite of multiplication is division. These 2's are gone, and that leaves me an i times the square root of 7. That is one messed up answer. But it's the answer. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, have you tried the fourth one yet? I'm not even ending the video, I'm just checking the time. I knew this was going to go long, but this video is about to end. What's wrong with the fourth one? Which, by the way, is the one that's different from the other three. Other three. Well, let's try solving it using square roots. If necessary, isolate the squared term. That would be the set squared. Which means I would have to subtract both of these terms to the other side. I can do that. I can get x squared equals negative 6 minus 1. Remember, when terms cross the equal sign, they change signs. And now square root both sides because that's what my next step is. But do you see the problem we're getting into? Yeah, it cancels the square on the x, and yeah, we can bring in a plus minus, but now I've got another x trapped under the square root. And although this technically says x equals, there's another x buried over here. An equation is done when you're solving it. When it says variable on one side, number on the other. This one doesn't. So why did this go wrong? Answer, there were multiple x terms. By having multiple x terms, one with the square, one without, the one without is destined to get trapped into the square root. Which brings me to the asterisk. How to solve using square roots? Asterisk, asterisk. Only works if there is one x term, or whatever the variable is. This first equation had a single x term, here it is. The second equation had a single x term, here it is. The third equation had a single x term, here it is. But the fourth one had two x terms. They were not like terms, I could not combine them to make it one. And so by solving for one, it traps the other. Oh, we just solved by factoring. Oh, well, if you thought that, that's great. Because remember, we have options. We can solve by factoring. We can solve using square roots. But I challenge you to factor this. Even if you think you know how to factor it. And you very well could. Because this guy won't factor either. Don't believe me? Try it. Go ahead. Try it. It won't. So now what? You can't solve by factoring, and you can't solve by using square roots. 
and we need a new approach. I'll show you that approach in the next video.